Flat Stanley, Stanley Fly Again by Jeff Brown. Chapter One, A Morning Surprise. Mrs. Lambchop was making breakfast. Mr. Lambchop at the kitchen table helped by reading bits of the morning paper. Here's an odd one, Harriet. He said, "There's a chicken in Sweden that rides a bike." So do I, George," said Mrs. Lambchop, not really listening. Listen to the milker being emptied to be collapsed next week. Imagine eight floors. Poor thing. Mrs. Lambchop set up the plate. Boys," she called. "Breakfast is ready." Her glance fell upon a row of photographs on the wall above the sink. There was a smiling Stanley, only a half inch thick. His big bulletin board, have having fallen from the. Bedroom wall to rest of it upon us overnight, upon him overnight. Next came, next came the reminders of many family adventures that had come after Stanley's young brother Arthur had cleverly blown him around round again with a bicycle pump. There were brothers with Prince Haras. The young genie who had granted wishes for them all after being accidentally summoned by Stanley from a lamp. There was the entire family with Santa Claus and his daughter Sarah taking during a Christmas visit to the North Pole. There was the family again in Washington D.C. in the office of the President of the United States. Who had asked them to undertake a secret mission into outer, sta- outer space? The last picture showed Arthur standing beside a balloon on which Mrs. Lanchop had painted a picture of Stanley's face. The balloon, its string, in fact, held by Stanley, had been a valuable guide to his presence. Since he was invisible all the time, boys," she called again. "Breakfast!" In the bedroom, Stanley and Arthur had finished dressing, while Stanley filled his backpack. Arthur bounced a tennis ball. "Let's go," he said. "Here, catch." Stanley had just reached for a book on the shelf of his bed. The ball struck his back, and he turned, and he banged his, banged his shoulder in the corner of the shelf. Ouch! Sorry, Arthur said. Let's go, okay? You know how long, Stanley? Why are you shouting? Stanley adjusted his pack. Come on! I'm so hungry. He paused. Oh boy. Arthur, do you see? I do, actually. <laughs> Arthur swallowed hard. You're, you, you know, fucked. The boys stared at each other. The pump, Stanley said, it might work again. Arthur fetched the bicycle pump from their toy chest. And Stanley lay on his bed with the house, house ends in his mouth. Arthur gave a long, steady pump. Stanley made a face. That hurts. Arthur pumped again, and Stanley snatched snatched the house from his mouth. Ow! That really hurts. It wasn't like that before. We. Better stop. Now what? Arthur said. You can't just hide it forever, you know. 
Mrs. Slamchop called. Call Mrs. Slamchop's call came again. Boys, please come. Jimmy and Phoebe, Sally said. You tell them. Store to get them ready. Okay. Okay. Said Arthur and went to tell. Arthur stood in the kitchen doorway. Hey, guess what? Hay is for horses, dear," said Mrs. Lambdrop. "Good morning. Breakfast is ready." "Good morning, Arthur," Mrs. Mr. Lambdrop said be behind the newspaper. "Guess where's where's Stanley?" "Guess what?" Arthur said again. Mrs. Lambdrop sighed. "Oh, all right. I can't guess." Tell Stanley's flat again," said Arthur. Mister Lambtop put down his paper. Missus Lambtop called, closed his eyes. "Flat again? Is that what you said?" "Yes, it's true. It's true." Stanley stood now beside Arthur in the doorway. Just look. Good grief," said Mister Lambtop. "I can't believe that bunny to work. It didn't fall on me this time," Stanley said. "It just got flat." Arthur tried to pump me, pump me up like before, but it hurt too much. Oh, Stanley! Missus Lambtop ran to kiss him. How do you feel now? Fine, actually. Stanley said, just surprised. Can I go to school? Mrs. Lambchop thought for a moment. Very well. Eat your breakfast. After school, we'll hear what Doctor Dan has to say. Chapter two. Doctor Dan. Ah.、Oh. Mr. and Mrs. Lambdrop and the boys," said Doctor Dan as they entered to his office. "How nice you!" His eyes widened. "Good heavens, Stanley!" Mr. Lambdrop. Mr. Lambdrop, you really must do something about that bulletin board. It is in front. It. It is still firmly in place, Doctor Dan. During Mrs. Lambchop said, "We are at loss to account of, for this attack of flatness." <sighs> Doctor Dan thought for a moment. Is there perhaps a family history of flatness? No. Mr. Lambtop said, "We remember that. We got dressed for school." Stanley explained, "We didn't even have breakfast, and all of a sudden I got flat." Doctor Dan frowned. "Nothing happened?、Uh, nothing at all?" "Well, Arthur hit me with a tennis ball." Stanley said, and then I bang my shoulder on. Aha!、Uh -huh. Jumping off, Doctor Dan took a large book from the case behind his desk. Desk and began to turn pa turning pages. This is Doctor Francis. Doctor Franz Jemister's excellent, difficult and peculiar cases. Just let me fall it. <laughs> Here it is. Flatness, page two seventeen. You read aloud. Sudden flatness,、uh, extremely rare. Minimal documentation. Documentation. Notation. Here's a report. Aha! Here it is. Dates back to the fifth century. During the battle, Mongo the Fierce, an 
ate to Attila the Hun, was stuck twice. Simultaneously from behind, and once became no thicker than a shield. He became known as the Mongo the Plate, and lived the old age without regaining his own girth. Dr. Dan closed the book. As I suspected, the OBP. But pardon? said Mrs. Lambchop. The OBP. Osteobalance point, Dr. Dan explained. A little now. And now. Anatomical feature. The human body, of course, is a complex miracle. Its skeleton. Its skeleton, a delicate framework of support. Of supports and balances, the osteobalance point may occur almost a- anywhere in the upper torso. It is vul- vulnerable, vul- vulnerable only to the application of s- simultaneous pressures at two points, which vary depending on the age and particular design. Let us. Say the, of the individual involved. In my opinion, the pressures created by the tennis ball in the shelf corner affected Stanley's OBP, thereby turning flat. For a moment, everyone was silent. The first time Stanley was flat, you were greatly puzzled by his condition. Mr. Lambdrop said at last, Now you seem remarkably well informed. I read up a bit upon it, said Dr. Nan. Mrs. Lambdrop sighed. Perhaps we should seek a second opinion. Who is the world leading authority on the OVP? That would be me, said Dr. Dan. I... I see. Well, <clears throat> we've taken enough of your time. Mr. Lambchop rose, motioning his family to follow. Thank you, Dr. Dan. At the door, Mrs. Lambchop turned. Perhaps if we found the, you, you know, you know o- OBP, we can make Sally. No, no! said Dr. Dan. It would be dangerous to put the lad through such a skeletal strain again. And finding the OVP not very likely, I'm afraid. Arthur had an idea. I know. If we all got sticks and hit Stanley all over the same time, he kept doing it, then that will do, Arthur, Mr. Lambtop said, and let his family out. Chapter 3 Stanley Sales. Early the next Sunday morning, Mr. Lambchop had a call from my old college friend Ralph Jones. Just wanted to remind you, George, that Stanley and I have a date to go to the sailing today, he said. He's looking forward to it, Ralph. <sighs> Mr. Lambchop hesitated. Uh, I should mention, perhaps, that Stanley has gone flat again. Mr. Jones died. <sighs> I thought he'd gone over that. Well, I'll pick him up at ten. Later that morning, driving with Stanley to a sailing club at the sh- on the seashore, Mr. Jones inquired about the for- foreign visitor he had once met with some lamb chops. Uh, Prince, yes. He around these days? Sally knew he meant the young genie, Prince Haras, 
but it would be difficult to explain not only the genie part, but also the Harris. Harris had returned to the genie kingdom for which she had come. No, Stanley said. He went home, actually. Too bad. Mr. Jones was famous for his amazing memory. Harris, uh, as I recall, Prince Bonnie Mustafa Al Asla Namir the Malke Namir Haras. Right, said Hanley. Right, said Stanley. In the harbor of the sailing club, Mr. Joan prepared his boat, Love Bug, and explained to Stanley. This big stay, sail. Here is the main sail. This big sail here is the main sail, and the and that's the big rubber back bit for steering. And this zip bag is another sail called a spin maker. Spin maker. We'll use that one for extra speed when you're running before the wind. See that boat away there? How it's, how it's spin maker is puffing up on front? Sally laughed. The spin maker looked like an open umbrella lying on its side. See over there, Mr. John went on. Between the com comedy boat with the judges on it, the red buoy, that's the starting line, the race ends back there too. First boat to be crossed the line wins. He cast off the mo mooring lo line and the main sail filled. Lovebug headed out to join the other boats. Mr. Joan pointed. There! That's Jasper Green's boat, windswept. He's the one I especially want to beat. Why? Are you mad at him? Stanley asked. He was very rude to me once. But never mind. Let's just make sure we win. Behind the start, start line, they found themselves beside the windswept. Jasper Green gave a friendly wave, but Rock John ignored him. You're always in a bad mood with me, Ralph, Mr. Green said. Why? I don't... Here we go! A pistol shot and signaled the start of the race. Love bug and wind swept, and the other racers glided across the start line behind the motor-powered comedy boat, which led them along a course marked by buoys and bright green streamers. Stanley sat back, enjoying himself. The sun was bright, the breeze fresh against his face, the sky clear and blue, the water a beautiful slate color. There were boats on both sides of them, sides of them, Boats ahead, boats behind, how pretty they were. Their white sails making cheerful crackling noises as they bellowed in the wind. Along the shore, people waved from the porters of houses, their voices carrying faintly on the wind. Way to go! Looking, looking good, sailors! Looking glad, one of them! Sally waved that back, knowing that the teasing was kindly meant. Lovebug passed other boats, but there was were many still more ahead. Meant there, there were many more still ahead, and now they were almost abreast of wind swept. Sally saw that Jasper Green had hoisted his spin maker, st spin maker. And that the other other boats have too. I got you the beat, Ralph. Jasper Green shouted. We'll just round this point, Sally. Then now, exclaimed Ralph Jones. Ralph Jones. Jones.
Let's show Jasper what running before the wind really means. He attached his spin maker to a harsh halyard and ran it up to the mast. Whoosh! The spin maker billowed out and Sally felt love bugs surge forth as if pushing by an invisible hand. Here we go! shouted Ralph Jones. They passed five more boats, three more, then windswept. They were ahead of everyone now. The fishes suddenly ahead. We're going to win! Sally shouted. Yes! Well, Wolf Jones shouted back, Just wait till Jasper rip! The sound came from above. Looking up, they saw that the top of the spin maker had torn. Rip! The rip streaked downward, and now the spin maker, torn all the way down, swept uselessly in the wind. Love bug slowed. Drat! Mr. Jones did his best with the mainsail. Drat, drat, drat! Windswept came up behind them. Tud luck! called Jasper Green. Ha ha! Drat! Mr. Jones sighed. <sighs> Nothing we can do, Sally, unless. This may be crazy, but Sally, perhaps. You could be a spin maker. Spin maker. What? Sally shouted. How? Good question. Said Mr. Jones. Jones. Let's see. First, we'll go take a hold of the mask. That's it. Now, maybe. Excuse me. Sally said. But did you ever do this before? Stanley, no one. Nobody ever did this before. Mr. Jones took a deep breath. <sighs> okay, now twist around the fa to face forward and grab the mask behind your uh you you above your head. Stanley did as he was told, planting his feet on the sides of the boat to hold him in place. The wind pressed him b from behind, driving. Driving Love Bug toward the finish line. Yes! Just forward, but back! shouted Mr. Jones. Best spin maker, spin maker I ever had. In a moment, they had passed windswept, and Stanley could not help laughing at the surprise on Jasper Green's face. And then they were across the finish line. Love Bug had won! Back in the clubhouse, Jasper Green would not admit that he had lost. A fat person used as a sail? He had never seen that before, he said. And he went to the race committee office to complain. But he returned shortly, shortly to report that Love Block had indeed won. The committee had advised him, he said that there was no rule against a crew member allowing the wind blow against him. Great selling, Ralph, he said. I thought it was my race. I really did. Jasper grew Thanks, Jasper, Mr. John said. But Stanley noticed that he did not smile. Jasper Green noticed. Jasper Green noticed too. Ralph, you're still mad at me, he said. But why? You spilled coffee on my white pants, Jasper, said Ralph Jones, and you just laughed when I jumped up. What? Jasper, Jasper Green seemed really greatly surprised. I don't remember where, when. Well, we're having lunch, said Mr. Jones. At the old Vanderhoek, Vanderhoek Hotel. The Vanderhoek? It closed down 20 years ago, 
Mr. Green slapped his forehead. I do remember that lunch was 20 years ago, Ralph. 21, actually. All right, all right, said Mr. Green. I apologize for heaven's sake. Ralph Jones smiled warmly. Perfectly all right, Jasper, he said. Don't give it another thought. Chapter 5 Why me? Sally had looked sad all evening. Arthur thought at the bedtime, at bedtime, as they lay waiting for Mr. and Mrs. Lambchop to come say goodnight, he wondered how to cheer his brother up. Is raining hard. And he remembered suddenly that the rainy evening that Stanley had snacked on raisins and by morning had come invisible. Little no consequence, Dr. Dana explained, of eating fruit during, during bad weather. Either way, Stanley, he said, better not eat any fruit. Ha ha ha. Stanley sound cr sounded cross. Just leave you alone, okay? Stanley's in a terrible mood, Arthur told Mr. and Mrs. Lambchop when they came in. He won't even talk to me. What's wrong, my boy? Mr. Lambchop said. Nothing. Stanley put his pillow over his head. If my picture was in the newspaper practically every day, I'd be happy, Arthur said. I mean, what? Mrs. Lambchop hushed him. Danny, dear, what's troubling you? Nothing, nothing, Stanley said from under his pillow and sat up. But why me? Why am I always getting fat or invisible or something? Can it just... Once be someone else? I wouldn't mind, actually, Arthur said. Just for a while, I... Hush, Arthur! Mrs. Lambchop pulled out the overhead light, lit a corner lamp, and sat by Sally on his bed. Mr. Lambchop sat with Arthur. The gentle patter of the rain against the windows, the girl of the little lamp, Need the bedroom cozy indeed. I do see what you mean, Stanley. <laughs> Mrs. Mr. Lambdrop said at last. Would it, would you? Why? Why do these things happen to you? Your mother and I don't know the answer either. But the things happen, happen without there is something to be a reason. And then something else happens, and then suddenly the first thing seems to have had a purpose after all. Well put, George. Mrs. Lambchop squeezed Stanley's hand. What we do know, Stanley's dear, is that we're very proud of you and love you very much. We, and we understand about the fatness and all the other unexpected happenings how upset upsetting it must be it sure is said Stanley how would you like to feel never knowing when you might get fat or invisible maybe someday you, I'll woke up ten feet tall or one in short or with green hair or a tail or something I know Mrs. Lambdrop said softly as Mr. and Mr. Lambdrop came and patted Stanley's shoulder, then kissed both boys, switched off the lamp, and went out. Arthur spoke into the darkness room. Stanley? I'm trying to sleep, said Stanley. What? I'm just thinking. I was just thinking, Arthur said. If you got invisible, then you got fat. How would they know? Huh? I don't... Stanley laughed. Oh, 
I get it about the planets. Good one, author. Author laughed. Said suddenly, Quiet, please. Said suddenly, I'm trying to sleep. Okay. <laughs> author said, but he chuckled several times before he fell asleep. Chapter 6 Emma Mr. Lambtop came home early the afternoon, full of excitement. Guess what? He said. The old murder department store downtown? Eight floors and all emptied out, waiting to be torn down? Well, because now most of it fall valid by itself. He switched on the TV. New time! Let's get the latest. Da, da, da. More on the maker, murder burden collapse. A newscaster will say, it just, um, It's just a mount of a photo now, folks. Three workmen have been treated for minor bruises. But no, but no other injuries are reported. The public is requested to avoid the area until... A young woman ran on, handed him a slip of paper, and ran up again. Hold on! Just, this is just it. This, the newscaster read from the slip. Wow! A little girl is trapped under all the wreckage. Emma Weeks, daughter of local businessman Oswald Weeks. Emma Weeks! Stanley exclaimed. She's in my class. No wonder she wasn't at school today. Emma is not hurt, as it appears. <clears throat> the newscaster continued. Fireman called to the scene. Can hear her calling up through the ch chinks in the wreckage, damaging, demanding food and water. But the fire chief Johnson has forbidden any rescue efforts, any disturbance. Any shifting of the wreckage, he, he says, might bring the rest of the building crashing down. Now, here's Tom Miller. The TV screen show, showed a reporter with a microphone standing by the wreckage wrecked building. Emma Leakes! shouted the reporter, pulling his microphone up to a crowd. Do you hear me? Are you all right? Emma's voice was faint, but clear. Oh, sure, I'm great. Oh, sure, I'm great. I hope a building falls on me every day, you know. Come on, get me out of here. Mrs. Sam's upside. Such an unfortunate tone. She is under great strain, of course. Emma's always like that, Sammy said. Half an hour later, while Miss, Mrs. Snamchop was preparing supper, a siren sounded outside, then died away. Opening the front door, Mr. Lambchop saw a fire department car at the curb. A fire department car at the curb on the doorstep stood Fire Chief Johnson and a very worried-looking man and woman. Mr. Lambchop, said Chief Johnson, I'll get... Right the point, sir. I reckon you're hurt about little Emma Weeks. Tra trapped in the murder wreck? Well, Mr. and Mrs. Weeks are here. I mean, we'd like a word with you folks. Of course. Mr. Lambchop let the visitors into the house and intru introduced them to his family. Oh, Mrs. Weeks! Mrs. Lambchop cried. Your poor daughter, you must be dreadfully worried. We are indeed, said Mrs. Mr. Weeks. We are indeed, said Mr. Weeks. But Chief Johnson thinks your Stanley might a be able to save Emma. Who, me? And who, Sally? Said Stanley and other. Chief John explained. Problem is uh, that if a policeman or one of my firemen Tries to dig his way, 
to Emma, the rest of the whole building crashed down on them. Too bad we don't have a flat fireman, I was thinking. Flat fella squeezed through all those narrow openings and we know they're there. Cause we hear Emma when she calls. Then I recollected the newspaper story. A picture of Sally there. Hit me me right away. That boy can make maybe wiggle to Emma. For a moment, everyone was silent. Then Mrs. Lambchop shook her head. It sounds terribly dangerous, she said. I'm sorry, but I must say no. It's a tad risky, ma'am, said Chief Johnson. But we got to remember the boy's already already back. Mrs. Weeks sobbed. Oh, poor Emma, how am I going to save her? Mrs. Lambchop's bit her lip. Sally made me remember something. I was just thinking. He turned to Miss, Mr. Lambchop. The other night when I got mad about all the crazy things that kept happening to me, remember what you said? You said sometimes things happen that nobody see can have a reason for sure. And then after something other thing happens and all of a sudden it seems like the first thing had had a reason after all well i was just thinking that me getting flat one it's one crazy thing and that maybe emma getting stuck there where i'm o the only one who can save her that might be the second thing with an amtrop nodded and took mrs amtrop's hand we should be very proud of her son, Harriet. Mrs. Lambchop thought for a moment. Stanley, she said at last, will you be very, very careful not to let that enormous building fall on you? Okay, sure, Sally said. Mrs. Lambchop turned to Mr. and Mrs. Weeks. We allowed Stanley to help, she said. He will do his best for Emma. Fine boy, got the brave as a lion, shouted Chief Johnson. Now listen up, folks. Mrs. Lambchop, you'll be getting things ready. Then Stanley can go right out and after Emma. Got that? Everybody meet us at the murder building 30 minutes from now. Chapter 7. Where are you, Emma? In the late afternoon sunlight, at the remains of the old Merger building, the lamb chops and the wheatses watched Chief Johnson prepare Stanley for his rescue attempt. Flash Tobin, the daily senior sentinel pro pro photographer, was there too taking pictures. Mrs. Lambchop sorry Mrs. Lambchop had supplied two slices of bread and cheese each wrapped in plastic and a grab grandfather's flat silver cigarette case filled with grape soda. Chief Johnson taped the bread and cheese packets to Stanley's arms and legs the cigarette case to his chest and gave him a small flat, flat, flat flashlight. Then he led Stanley to a tall crowd in the wreckage. Emma! He shouted. Fellas! Coming to help you! When he calls your name, you holler back here so he knows which way to go. Got that? Emma's voice came faintly. Yeah! Yeah, yeah, hurry up, I'm starving! Chief Johnson shook Stanley's hand. Good luck, son. The evening light glowed warmly on the red bricks of the fallen, fallen building. As Stanley stepped close to the crack, crack. Mrs. Lambchop waved to him, and Stanley waved up. 
How handsome he is! She thought. How brave! How tall! How fat! Jiang took two steps forward and disappeared sideways. To the crack. A moment later, they heard a shout. Hey! It's really dark in here. Hey, it's for ha- house horses, Stanley. Mrs. Lambdrop called back. Oh, never mind. Good luck, dear. The this was a dark greater than any he had ever known. Stanley could almost feel the blackness on his skin. He clicked on a flashlight and edged forward with, without difficulty. But when the crack narrowed, slowing him, the bread slice on his left leg had scraped something, loosening the tape that held it. Pressing the tape back to it into place, he wiggled. He wiggled forward until he came to what seemed a dead end. A little, a little swing from the flashlight showed cracks branching right and left. Emma, he called. Here. Her voice called from the right, so he moved along that branch. Emma. Yeah, yeah. What? When I say your name, you're supposed to say. Here, I already did that. Her, he followed another crack to the left. Emma, there's no answer. Sally managed a few more feet and then quite. Suddenly, quite suddenly, the crack widened. He called again, "Emma, bananas! Keep talking!" He shouted, "I need to hear you, bananas! Here, whatever, blah blah, whatever. Hey, I can see your light." And there she was. The crack had widened to become a small cave, at the back of which sat Emma. Her jeans and her shirt were smudged with dirt, but it was. Most surely, Emma, Emma, squinting the brightness of his light. You! She exclaimed, "From school, the flatty!" Don't lose your temper, Stanley told her himself. I was the only one they thought of getting there. How are you doing, Emma? Emma rolled her eyes. Oh, just great! A whole building falls on me, and they send in a flatty. And now I'm starving to death. Stanley untaped the slices of bread and cheese and handed them over. Cheese? Huh. Emma put her sandwich together and took a bite. I hate cheese. Got anything to drink, fatty? Please don't call me fatty. Here, he held out the silver cigarette case. Emma rolled her eyes again. I'm not allowed to smoke. It's soda. She opened the cigarette case and sipped. Blah. I hate grape. Chief Johnson's voice rose for a hum in the wall behind her. Stanley, you there yet? Emma jerked her thumb and at the hum. It's for you, buddy. I'm here, Chief. Stanley called. Emma's okay. He heard cheering, and then the chief's voice came again. See a way out, Stan? 
I haven't had a chance to look around yet. Emma's eating. We oui, wait. Oui. Over and out, Stan. You too. Danny called. He waited until Emma had finished her sandwich. Emma, how did you get into this mess? What made you come in here? I just came over to look, Emma said. And then they had all these like, danger keep out all over the place. Even behind the parking lot, keep out. Danger, danger. I really hate that, you know. So there was this door, and it was open. So I went in. She finished the grape soda. Okay, let's go. Now the way I came in, Sally said, I could just barely squeeze two through. And we have to be careful because... I know, Emma interrupted. Chief, what did, what's his name? Kept telling me, don't move around. The whole rest of the building might crash down. So I'm supposed to live down here forever. The story you came for, through, Sally said. How far did you come to find this sort of cave run? Who said anything about far? I just got inside and there was these crashing noises. And, there was the, and the whole building was shaking. And I fell down right there, right here. The crashing went on forever. Thought I was going to die. Calm down. An idea came to Stanley's snout in the head. Just where was the store? Do you remember? Over there somewhere. Emma pointed to into the darkness of the corner behind her. Stanley swung his light, but saw only what seemed to be a solid wall of splinters, boards, and brick. Emma pointed a bit left, then right. Maybe there. I don't know. Was I supposed to take pictures or something? What difference did us make? We might be just a little bit inside that door, Sally said. And what we want is to be just outside of it. Moving closer to the, to the corner, he saw that a jack piece of wood produced a, at waist level. It came out easily when he tucked, followed by loose dirt. Emma stood beside him. Why are you making all this mess? He poked in the hole with a stick. Maybe I'll find dirt cascaded from the wall covering his shoes. He saw the light now, now just the little circle from his flashlight. Wait. But daylight! Unmistakably daylight! Ooh! said Emma. Stanley made, a, made the hole larger. They saw a door laying lay on its side across the bottom of the hole. Wreckage limiting the open on both sides. But it's big enough. They would be able to wiggle Joe. He ran back to the wall from the where which Chief Johnson's voice had come. We're on our way out, he shouted. We'll be back in the count country counter yard. Got it came the chief's voice. Great work Danny turned to Emma. Let's go. I'll get all dirty, silly. Emma said. Maybe you could just come on. Don't yell, Emma said. But she crawled quickly through the hole with Stanley right behind her. Chapter 8. Hero! There was much, much rejoicing in the country yard. Mrs. Thumbtrap kissed Sally and Arthur. Mrs. Sweeks kissed Emma. And then everyone else, even Fast Tobin, who had arrived to take pictures. 
Mr. Lamb Chops shook hands with the we with Weeks, Miss, Mr. Weeks, and Chief Johnson, who announced several times that Stanley was a great hero. Flash Tobin took a group picture of all the lamb chops. Need one more, he said. Emma, just you and Sally. You're here, right? Save your life. I could have gotten out my myself, Emma said. I just didn't know exactly where the door was. But she went to stand beside Stanley. Smile! Fast Tobin took the picture. Yeah, that's good. He gave a Stanley a cheerful slap on the back, just as Emma's elbow jabbed hard into Stanley's ribs. Ow! Stanley yelled. Emma grinned. That's for you, Mr. Hero. Are you crazy? What? Stanley sobbed. Everybody was staring at him. He felt peculiar, as if, yes, he was getting round again. Wow, how do you do that? Hooray for you, dear, said Mrs. Lambtops, and more cries rose from the others in the country yard. Do you see what I see? He's blowing up. Are, you, are we crazy or what? Flash Tobin aimed his camera again. Hold it, kid! But it was too late. Before him now stood a smiling Stanley Lambchop, shaped like a regular boy. Mr. Lambchop ran to hug him, and everyone else applauded. Being 30 years with a cheap fire apartment, I never saw something like that, said Chief Johnson. Wouldn't have missed it. I'm really glad, glad, Stanley said. But what what made it happen? What Dr. Dad said, shouted an author. Remember the osteopistol or whatever? The OBP, the osteobalance point. Mr. Lambchop smiled. Yes, the slap from the back from Flash Tobin and the poke from Emma. That did it! A board fell from the tilting roof of the Mercury building, building, landing in a court, corner of the courtyard. Let's go, folks, said Chief Johnson. We're not safe here. A moment later, back out in the street, there was more hugging and kissing and saying goodnight. Suddenly, behind them, there was a great creaking and grinding sounds. Turning, they watched what was left of the murder building coming crashing down. Emma so spoke first. Oh boy, she said softly. Wow. Miss, Mrs. Weeks caught her eye and gave a little nod towards Stanley. Emma looked puzzled. Huh? Oh, yeah. She turned to Stanley. I guess maybe you, you know, saved my life, whatever. She kissed his cheeks. Thank you very much, Stanley, lamb chop. It's okay. Stanley said, quite red in the face. You're welcome. Everyone went, everyone went home. Chapter 9. Fame. At bedtime next evening, the Lamb Chops read again the Daily Senior as they enjoyed so much at breakfast that morning. The front page headline read, Rude Girl, girl Saved. Flat Rescuer Regains Shape. There was also two Flash Tobin photographs, the Lamb Chop family picture, and one of Stanley and Emma taken just before he poked him on the ribs.
author was particularly pleased with the family picture. Finally, he said, not just family. People could have been wondering he had a brother, you know. Can I have this one? You may, said Mrs. Lambdrop. I want the one of Sammy and Emma for my kitchen wall. I don't care about the pictures, Sammy said. I just hope I never get, go back to flat being fat. Mrs. Slamchop patted his head. I told Dr. Dan about your recovery, dear. He thinks it is almost unlikely the fat list will occur yet again. Yay! said Stanley. Arthur cut the fat main picture out of the paper and used a red pencil to draw an arrow pointing pointing up at him. In the white space at the bottom on the under under the arrow he wrote Hero's Brother. Then he taped the picture to the wall above his bed. Soon all the lamp drops were asleep. The 